start with Brian. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the one and only, our friend, Nigel Morris. <laughs> right, Elvis Presley, uh, the uh, a juggernaut in the in the uh, in the uh, stuff you sent out. I, I'm not sure what a juggernaut is, but <laughs> we'll see if we can well, do I one mean, of those. Last time we used Mark Zuckerberg and our speaker last last time didn't like that, so he didn't like Juggernaut. He didn't like Zuckerberg, so oh. we're, it's, we're gonna switch it off with that Elvis that Presley. But that anyways, works. um, you know what? Uh, I'm really excited that you're here. Um, you're you are like what I compared to the Tooth Fairy, and you know why? Um, because no, there's a lot of people that claim they got a lot of money from you, but no one has ever seen you. <laughs> so, uh, well, I am so glad you were here in flesh. So, I'm so glad. So, anyways, so glad. Um, Human from um, uh, Human from Webs.com. Right. Talk highly of you, uh, Harun. Right. Harun from uh, from uh, Add This right. and uh, Brian Johnson. Right. Braintree. Right. He said that Brian you were instrumental in their success. So, yeah, so glad we're here. Right. So, Brian's good. Yeah. Good <laughs> anyways, we like to we like to start our uh, our fireside chat. Um, on a personal note, so if you can kind of tell us where you're born, uh, where you're raised, what did your parents do when you immigrated here to the United States? So, start um, with you. Well, we'll try and keep this uh, reasonably short, I suppose. Um, so, I, I grew up in the north of England and in North Wales, and uh, uh, my uh, dad was in the army, so he moved around a great deal. We were in Northern Ireland and other places. Um, Mum came from North Wales. Uh, she, English was a second language to her. Everybody thinks that everybody in the British Isles speaks English. Not true. Uh, you know, in the northern part of Wales, they speak a, a Celtic Gaelic that's absolutely and totally unintelligible uh, to normal human beings. So there's it's a small number of people up there, very passionately uh, uh, Welsh from the north. So I grew up there. I, I went to 11 different schools by the time I was 11, so I moved around a tremendous amount. So j just long enough to kind of get the lay of the land and know where the bathrooms were, but not long enough to any build any lo long-term relationship. Then I went to a, a, a Northern English rugby school uh, where you know, it was all about being tough and uh, being out on the playing fields. So that was good fun uh, in some ways. Um, I wanted to be a clinical psychologist. I went off and uh, read psychology as an undergraduate. I went in believing I was going to be, uh, you know, uh, really get excited by uh, Freud and Jung and left as a raving empiricist, and um, if, uh, if, if, um, if it can't be measured, it doesn't exist, and spent most of my time you know, messing about with experimental method and statistics rather than what people look like on couches. So, so when did you, uh, how, how old were you when you immigrated here? I, came, I was at London Business School uh, doing my MBA. I'm actually on the board there now, and um, I came over and did a, uh, a semester at Wharton um, in, um, in Philadelphia and uh, uh, basically stayed after that. It's very interesting, actually, because I don't know how many of you are from or know Philadelphia well, but Philadelphia's changed a tremendous amount. When I was there, I remember uh, uh, checking into Grad Towers V on Chestnut Street, and there's a grizzled old guy there behind the desk, and he said, listen here, English boy, when you go out of this building, always go downhill. Do not go uphill, or you'll never make it back. And at that point, uh, you know, Penn, or Wharton, was on the edge of the good area. And uh, if you remember, I don't remember, there was a thing called the Move, which was a Rasta Farai group that got bombed by the, uh, by the mayor in like 85 or 86. And that was an interesting time. Now uh, Philadelphia is much uh, renovated and much renaissance. Do you go back to Philadelphia? I was actually born in Philly, so yeah. I love Philadelphia. I, lo I love the business school there. It's a great place to go. And uh, we did a lot of recruiting at my old consulting firm and uh, Capital One. We did a huge amount of recruiting at, at, uh, at Wharton. So when did you uh, move here to DC? So, I, so I, I, uh, um, when I came out of business school, uh, LBS and Wharton, I worked for a strategy consulting firm here in Washington uh, called SPA. And SPA is, is now part of Mercer Management, and it was a BCG spin-off. And their kind of line was, you know, we're more BCG than BCG. So it's a very kind of quant place, very much, um, you know, leveraging data, very much uh, reinventing business models the whole time much more strategy than management, so much less McKinsey and much more BCG, if you like. 
And uh, we were in uh, uh, the Watergate building. And of course, all I could think of when I turned up there on my first day, the Watergate building, I'm thinking of Nixon and the scandals. And it actually, was it, it was this week, I think, or 40 years ago, that, that was all going on. So um, very interesting times. So, um, and not to think that scandals, that, that scandals have gone away. Right, right, right absolutely. You know, we've got the IRS, uh, we've, got, got, we've Clinton, got Libya, right. we've got, uh, and, uh, we've got uh, the uh, AP reporting issues all right. going on at this time. So Washington's such a lovely place to be. You get to exactly. see all the experience, all these, all these scandals firsthand. Yeah. Miss Philly? <laughs> Philly? Philly was corrupt in the Middle Ages. Uh, you know, the fire chief and the... Uh, Police chief were all related. Everybody was had each other hands in each other's pockets. I think it got cleaned up though. Probably cleaned up well before you were born. In 1975, probably right. <laughs> um, I, I, actually, I wanted to. This is a question we always ask. You know, very famous founders. Like, when you were younger, do you have like a funny story where you, you know, when you're younger, hustle somebody out of a quarter? You know, earlier earlier days. You have a little story? No. Okay, all right, we'll go, we'll, we'll go to I'll Capital. I'll somebody out of the court. <laughs> but I'll think about it while we're talking, and maybe sure. I'll come back to something. Okay, else. sure, sure. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go straight right to the Capital One story. Um, so tell us, um, Capital One came to be in 1988, right? Around there. Well, uh, um, we, Rich Fairbank and I were at this consulting firm I right. mentioned earlier, SPA. Yeah. And um, you know, I don't know how, uh, how many of you have tracked strategy consulting, but th there was a time up until about the middle 80s where going to a proper business school and uh, you know, get, ma managing to get an MBA was enough of a credential to be a strategy consultant. And you didn't really have to have any kind of vertical expertise. Around the time of the middle 80s, uh, that you, the, you started people developing you know, fast moving goods, consumer goods or financial services or you know, technology uh, you know, expertise. And um, where Rich and I formed the banking practice at SPA in the middle and late 80s together. And we did a lot of work for big banks, a lot of times shuttling back and forth up to uh, New York. And you know, I, I live in Alexandria, and I, I picked on living in Alexandria because it was close to the National Airport. And those days, you used to be able to basically leave 45 minutes before the flight was due, get there 25 minutes, no security of any real note, and you'd be able to jump on the plane. It was like getting on a bus. It was really very easy. But um, so, you know, so he and I worked together doing a lot of work for big banks and really looking at their um, uh, businesses by, by uh, looking for profitability and return on equity inside of a large bank conglomerate. So basically the idea was you busted a bank up into its constituent parts, you allocated equity, the amount of equity to each business line, and you figured out where the bank was making a great return and where it wasn't. And we found time after time doing this for the big banks that there was this business called the credit card business that was growing at 20 and 30% a year. It was making 30, 40% return on equity. And candidly, it wasn't being managed very, by the superstars in the bank. The superstars were in the investment banking area. The superstars were doing FX trading. And we kept saying, gosh, let's go let's, you know, to the bank. We'd love to talk more about your credit card business. Look how great it is. Look how much money you make. And the banks would always say, yeah, 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 but let's talk about these other businesses. So we started really looking at credit cards and said, gosh, this is a fantastic business, but boy, is it, are there opportunities to do it differently. So we started to say, look, what if, instead of giving everybody the same product at the same price, what if you started to discriminate based on underlying risk, for example? You know, we've seen uh, you know, in uh, annuity products, in uh, insurances, you can act actuarially predict risk. And of course, we, we, if uh, two people went and got car insurance, one is 25 and one is 45, one has had uh, DUIs and one hasn't, one has smashed his car up and the other one hasn't, you, know, you expect to get different pricing. It's understood that that's part of the game. In the credit card business uh, in the late 80s, it was one price fits all, which meant that half of America couldn't get credit cards. And actually, full circle now, you know, all these years later, half of America still can't get credit cards. They got some for the bit, and now they've all been taken away again. We can come, come back to that if you want. But so, so half America couldn't get cards, and then the, or the other half of America got the same product. So our notion was, let's go into the data. Let's actuarially predict underlying risk. Let's understand different consumer needs. Some people want an, uh, a, a, a fee, but are willing to charge uh, for a lower APR. Other people want it the other way around. Some people want points, some people don't want points. 
Some people want a picture of their favorite dog on the plastic. Some people are very happy having Signet Bank on the plastic. So you could actually uh, have an infinite number of segmentations. So to us, the credit card industry was a giant laboratory in which we could do two things. We could unleash infinite test and learn capability to actually figure out what product to offer to what person at the right time at the right price and do that with actuarial precision. And at the same time, the second piece of it is using net present value as the currency by which you compare ideas, you could actually fully optimize the whole laboratory. Now, we went out and sold that idea to all the big banks. And we exactly sold zero of them on the idea. And it was like, you know, it was really fascinating. They'd listen to us and they'd go, look, this can't be done. And if it can be done, you guys can't do it. Look at you. You, you know, you're two guys out of business school. You've been strategy consultants. So many of you have been entrepreneurs and you've had big C's look at you and they're going, I wonder if these, this guy or this girl can really pull this off. We were in the same boat. And uh, we, by chance, hit on a, a bank down in, uh, in Richmond called Signet Bank. And Signet said, OK, we buy this. It makes sense. But you have to leave the coziness of strategy consulting and all the prestige and the wonderful things that go along with it. And you have to come, out, come, come down to Richmond and, and make this happen. How old were you guys when you guys? I, I was, uh, Rich is a little older. He was probably uh, 31, 32, and I was 26, 27. So we were pretty young at that point when, uh, when we had that put in front of us. Yeah, because, you know, I mean, you're, essentially you're two consultants, right, right, shopping this thing around. Signet had brought you guys in, right, from Richmond. And uh, you guys took over their already existing credit card business, right? Right, right. And uh, so tell us about that, like how that process went. And, you know, you guys pretty much took it over and... and the child got bigger than the, than the, paper, well, the, the parent, right? It was a t but it was a terrifying situation. So all you've ever done is, all you've ever managed is two or three people who have the same kind of pedigree that you have um, uh, you know, in a consulting business, maybe a bit more than two or three, but not many more. And all of a sudden, you find yourself in a situation where you've got a business that's got hundreds and hundreds of people in it. And we didn't go from being uh, the strategy guys to running the thing overnight. That, gr that occurred gr gradually. But, you know, look, I, I remember um, many, uh, I remember one situation when we were getting ready to do the spin-off where the, um, the woman who was running customer service, um, we gave the people who were part of Signet the option of the credit card to stay with the bank or to come with us and be Capital One. And it was very interesting how uh, people self-select uh, when they were given such a choice. You know, do we follow, you know, Richard and Nigel down this, you know, uh, dream that they have or do we stay with the safety of Signet Bank in our hometown of Richmond? Many of them didn't come, and uh, we found ourselves very quickly actually having to manage things that we had no idea how to manage. And I remember taking on r running customer service at Signet, hundreds of people at that point, and I'd never, I, you know, I'd never done a customer service job. I have great respect for the people that do it well, uh, but I was given the uh, opportunity to try and build this thing, and it was really a great challenge. It was a fantastic challenge. I. You know, I believed up until that point that superior intellect and better analytics and more convincing slides were the key to success. But you know what? Getting in front of people who make, you know, $25,000 a year, who, um, you know, are, have to listen to calls time and time and time again, and they're actually, in a sense, force-fed the calls because as soon as they put the receiver down, there's another call. There's very little break. Figuring out how to talk to those folks and motivate those folks and build them into an organization was a fantastic challenge. I mean, I was totally unsuited for it. I was totally inexperienced in it. And I tried to learn pretty quickly. How, like, how many people did you have under, under, under Oh, you? hundreds. Hundreds, OK. Because um, I actually wanted to talk before you had spun off, because there was a time where, um, so basically, Signet had this real estate loan division that pretty much like sunk, right? I mean, it, lost, it had huge losses, and then they looked at you and Richard and say, we're going to have to close you guys up, right? Because they, they had to streamline their process. And so this, this was, a, this was a, an inflection point for you guys where like, well, we got to really think outside the box and make, make something work, right? So let's well, talk about this whole disruptive Well, you know, with the, the notion of, be, of I mean, that we, we, were, um, we totally uh, mis uh, misjudged how long it would take to build this information-based strategy at Signet Bank. 
we thought it would take a few months. And when we were at our most grandiose, when we were doing slides to present to their management that they bought into, you know, we, were, we thought this could be done. Now, of course, we'd never done it, and we didn't know anybody that had ever done it. So we tragically uh, got the numbers way wrong of how long it took and how costly it was. And as we were doing the testing, Signet Bank, the management, were watching us going, do these guys have any idea what they're doing? Are they going to really pull this off? And um, what happened was that Signet Bank got into a real estate pickle, commercial real estate. They had what they called the Golden Crescent. The Golden Crescent was um, from Baltimore to Washington to Richmond. And largely as a result of you know, a government expenditure, they believed, wrongly, um, that that uh, particular geography was immune to any kind of uh, meltdown from a real estate problem perspective. And what, what happened was, just when we felt the, uh, the uh, uh, boiling of the water was getting too hot for the frogs that were in there, uh, Signet Bank got very distracted with their real estate problem, which turned out to be fantastic serendipity for us. Because as a result, the management focused their time and energy on the real estate problem, giving us enough time uh, to be able to uh, pull the thing off organizationally, executionally and then to find the first big wins that came out of the strategy. So let's talk about the first one because one of the disruptive ideas you guys have, because you guys were pretty much the disruptor in the banking and lending industry. One of the things that you had uh, trailblazed was this whole balance transfer, right? And it, is that was the first time when you started getting a lot of traction for, uh, for your idea before it spun off to Capital One? Yeah, I mean, the, the idea was, and it's not particularly revolutionary now when you look back on it, it then it was, um, you know, you, it was heresy. But the idea was, instead of charging everybody 19.8% APR and a $20 fee, we're going to cherry pick the best customers, the ones who borrow a lot, but who are very, very low risk, what we call the elusive low risk revolver. And we found that we could actually a priori predict who they were using credit bureau and other data sets. And we found that we could reach them by direct mail. And we found that if we put in front of them a compelling offer, and the offer basically was, look, don't, don't pay 18, uh, 18, no, 19.8%, pay 13%. We will offer you a teaser rate. The teaser rate was one of the big breakthroughs from a, uh, a product positioning perspective. A teaser rate, so you'll get you know, a lower rate for a period of time, then it will go up. And all you have to do is sign this little form at the bottom and we will balance transfer the money away from Chase or City or B of A into the Signet account. And it was the combination of being able to find them, uh, uh, predict who they were, and then get them to come over in droves. And we found that we were getting five or six month paybacks. So I spend $100, and in five months I get my $100 back. That, by the way, is a very nice business if you can do it. And if any of you are managing to figure out how to do that in your own businesses, we should come, and, should come along and talk later on. It's not an easy thing to do, and we had all the actuarial data. So we, we were looking at everything on a cohort basis, on a tranche basis, so we could see money being made in front of our eyes. It's an amazing thing. Yeah, I mean, um, so it's, it's, it's like the secret sauce was, right, I mean, you're pretty much cherry picking your competitors, right? Because, you know, we have, you know, you'll have like these big spenders right. who are, Big, they have big balances on their credit card, and you'd be like, hey, just 0% finance, right? I mean, 0%, once you come over here for, I mean, what, six months or a couple weeks, and then they'll, they'll, they'll move over their, their, their balances. Their balances. Yeah, right. And I mean, so, yeah. I mean, look, I think that you know, in the early days, you didn't have to give that much away because the, the opportunity cost pricing was 19.8. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist to say, look, I've got $2,000 or $1,000 on the, on, the, on the balance. If I drop that by 5%, that's you know, 50 or 100 bucks that immediately flows into my wallet. I mean, that was starting to get very interesting. So that was, that was the first segment that got really exciting. We did a whole bunch of others that developed over time. The second one that was really interesting was, I, I said earlier, that at 19.8% APR, half of America couldn't get a credit card. So we focused a lot of time on how do you develop products that can work with a population that's not as credit worthy. And you know, I, I was a, a, an advocate of this, because I, I said, look, when I came to America in 1985, my social security number and my date of birth don't match. Right? But most people here who are born in America, your, your social security number is given at your date of birth. Mine was given when I came to America. 
So my social security number uh, suggests that I am now 25 years of age when I'm really 50, whatever I am, right? So uh, that would mean that I got turned down for credit all over the place because that was a fraud risk. So I'm saying, gosh, you know, America here, you've got lots of immigrant populations coming in, number one, and two, you've got a lot of people who have what are called thin files. You come out of, uh, remember your parents telling you when you came out of college, get, take a credit card out just so you can build a credit history so you can then get a mortgage, blah, 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 blah. So there was a thin file problem. It's not all bad people who've, who've taken advantage of credit and then not paid back. There were lots of populations who were excluded from credit. So the notion of being able to democratize the process by putting customized products in those people's hands that give them the utility and at the same time be able to make money. You know, you go to a hotel, and it's not so bad now because you have debit, but 20 years ago, if you didn't have a credit card, very hard to rent a car, very hard to check into a hotel. You check into a hotel and watch people start counting out the 20s. I mean, the, the whole place stops and looks, you know, it's really kind of a funny thing. So plastic and having access to plastic was a, a kind of a, a necessary for people to be able to run their lives in the same way now we use a smartphone, uh, a credit card was an, a, a really a critical piece of the chain. So our approach was to develop a hypothesis of which kind of folks would be interested in what kind of product and then testing into those different populations and customizing the product to meet their needs. And then time after time uh, refining and optimizing that as we develop more and more variations on the thing. Yeah, I mean, so that's kind of like my next question about, I mean, so we're all startups here and we all know languages of like lean startup, you right. know, uh, those theories and stuff. And when you had done your pilot, I mean, because you're, you're actually doing a pilot, right? I right. mean, because you're at a company that's, that has a pretty broad customer base. How did you do that pilot? I mean, and, and what kind of like metrics we were looking at oh. and to know that, wow, hey, we're going to pour more money in there, and then ultimately it's the spinoff, right? So yeah, we'll look, so the, 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 the approach was very, was very disciplined, and I think that uh, you know, that's what led to Capital One's success, how focused and disciplined we were. So if we didn't know what we were doing, we were going to test on a small sample. Test on a big sample or, and get credit wrong, and credit will burn your house down. Really, it will. It's a very terrifying uh, piece of, a, a, of an economic equation. So we would test small, and we would watch the results. And then we would test again and make sure that that was not just a one-off, and we would make sure that we uh, uh, had the economics nailed. Uh, um, and you know, we, we felt it was in the end it was like cheating at cards because you knew the answer uh, before you rolled it out because you'd already tested it. And it's so extraordinary today, and it's so enlightening that even now people in retail financial services do not do that. They do not rigorously A/B test. They do not build models to predict what's going to happen a priori. They do not form hypotheses in advance. So that was our approach. So, by, so as we took, played more and more a role of Signet, we took on more and more responsibility. I eventually figured out how to manage customer service by hiring the right people who could do it for me. And, uh, and the same thing with collections and all the other areas. But what we did, we said, gosh, you know, um, as we were beginning to transform the bank. The bank was a relatively sleepy but very well run and uh, you know, great people down there in Richmond. And when the securities analysts wanted to talk to um, Signet, they said, what's going on with this credit card business? We see that the, the credit card business is now making 40% of the profits of the bank, and probably in shareholder value represented 70 or 80% of the value of the bank. And we became the story, the juggernaut within, uh, within uh, Signet, which led then to the bankers saying, there's a thing called a conglomerate discount. A conglomerate discount is where you have two businesses that are very different uh, within one uh, sort of, uh, uh, publicly traded entity. And you, the argument is if you separate them, 2 plus 2 equals 5, because then the, the uh, different people can buy stock in either one based on what they want to do, and the story can be told in more of a uh, monoline way, if you like. And that's actually going to be my question was, um, when did you determine that you needed to spin it off? And was it the bankers that... Yeah, well, we look, that, it, wasn't, it wasn't Nigel Morris and, and Richard saying, hey, you know, we're taking, this is 40, we're 40% of your bottom line. Well, it's, a, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting dynamic because we started to, of course, realize that we had something that was fantastically exciting. We had uh, the process, the methodologies at that point, and we had the data. We knew what worked. So um, the bankers were saying, look, you've got the, the, you have to spin this thing off. Uh, in order for Signet Bank to be able to um, do right by its shareholders. But at the same time, you know, the, bank was, the, the, the bank was reticent to do that 
uh, because they didn't know that we, we were not part of Signet Bank. We'd been there a few short years, and we did not grow up in Richmond. Uh, we did not go to UVA. We were not part of that. Uh, go, we, our kids did not go to collegiate. I mean, there's a very much a kind of a blue blood culture that exists, uh, existed and probably still does in Richmond. So no, the bank came to us and said, hey, we want to spin this off. Will you run it? Uh, because at that time, Rich and I were starting to say, hey, we don't want to stay at Signet Bank for the rest of our life. We can do this somewhere else. And we know how to do it. And did we they, know it did works. they know that? So that's, so yeah, it was. You know, we were, you know, they, they've been incredibly good to us. Uh, in giving us the chance to, uh, to make this thing happen. And they've been very patient, part of which was serendipitous as they chased around and worried about real estate. And I will tell you one thing, I remember Rich and I used to travel up and down on I-95. Neither of us moved to Richmond, by the way. Uh, he lived in McLean, I lived in Alexandria. We, we would go down in these uh, Crown Victorias. You probably don't even know what a Crown Victoria is. Now. That's a cop car. Huh? It was a cop car, right? And it looked like, they looked, one was black and one was gray. They looked like cop cars. And I remember driving back one day with Rich, and uh, we thought that, you know, uh, this, we were saying, I wonder if we're going to get fired today. I wonder if this is going to be the day where they're going to run out of patience with all our arm waving and all our slides. And I remember Rich saying, you know, Nigel, I think the, uh, the, uh, the darkest time is just before the dawn. And I remember him saying that, and I remember saying, yeah, let's hope so, because it's pretty dark at the moment, and, uh, you know, we, we're not sure if this is going to happen. But you know what? It did happen. We saw the results. It was gangbusters. And we were given the chance to, actually, Rich was given the chance to be CEO. I, I, he said, Nigel, will you come and be COO and president? And then we took the company public in uh, 1994, the end of 94. So, I mean, that negotiation must, I mean, this is probably the most important negotiation of your life, right? When they're spinning off, because you got a pretty nice chunk of the company, right? I mean, you, you two. You know, look, I, I certainly don't have any, uh, any complaints. It actually worked out really well, right? Glad to hear. Um, yeah, it was great. Um, now, if you, have, if, you are, if you say, could, you, how could it have been different? Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, I, I'm not sure if I could spell private equity then. And I certainly couldn't tell you what the difference between a venture capitalist and a private equity person was. Looking back on it, so you, you have two entrepreneurs then who have all the data. Uh, they've already built the thing. They know it works because they have the data. The people will follow them because they, they, the people were with us, not with Signet at that point. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing for private equity to invest in? Yeah. So and if you thought about how much we would have got of a company if, um, if you'd have been able to tell that story well, you know, we did okay, but we could have done differently, done more. That's to say, that, that said, there would have been different risks and it would have been more traumatic, etc. And Signet had um, been fabulously good to us. So our tendency was what was wanting to do right by them and take this dream. And we were really, really excited that, you know, we had the chance to build something that uh, could make a difference. Yeah, I mean, so it sounds like uh, it was like a, a spinoff, but it was like a startup within a big corporation. And you, this was pretty much bootstrapped, right? You didn't get outside funding, no institutional funds? No. I, look, the, so yeah, so we we uh, we we went and traded in the in the market uh, and started, I think, on, in February of 1995. Started trading. Yeah, so we had to we had to make the thing work. We had to raise what we needed to raise. So did your um, I mean, did so when you spun it off? Uh, I mean, nothing really changed, right? I mean, it was just you were still cranking on your business. Did you have like oh, different marketing no, strategy or? Well, a lot of things changed. Okay, sure. Remember, you were, you were running a division within a regional bank, and all of a sudden, you're a public company. Um, so you have to learn how to speak to the debt, debt markets, the Moody's and S&P, and uh, Fitch. What's our story? We hadn't talked to those folks very much. We had to learn how to talk to the securities analysts out there. Okay, and what's our story, and can you do that convincingly? Uh, I remember Bob Freeman, um, who's actually uh, passed away now, but he was the CEO of Signet. <laughs> I remember going to him uh, a year or so before we went um, public as Capital One. I said, Bob, this is working in the US. It'll work in the UK and it'll work in Canada. I tell you, I know it will. Let's go do it. He said, we don't invest in foreign countries. I said, I know, but it is Canada and it is the UK. <laughs> and mostly there's some similarities, you know, that you know, the country's well, relatively well developed and everybody speaks English and there's a rule of law. No, we don't invest in other countries. I said, uh, I, maybe I went too far. I said, look, it's not, you know, like investing in sort of Latin America at that point, you know, developing countries. 
And he almost threw me out of his office and said, no way. So one thing that did change was that as soon as we went public, we um, uh, launched the business in the UK and Canada, which turned out to be fabulously successful for all those reasons. The other thing that changed was that we didn't have a brand name. You know, nobody, we, we, we came up with the idea, it was, it actually it was between Global One and Capital One were the two names that we were talking about. Wait, what was the, what was the name? It was six, still Signet? Yeah, it was, it was a Signet until we spun off, and of course they had all the rights to the name, so we were whatever we wanted to call it. And it's very interesting that any name that you want, some of you have gone through this, any name you want, some of you have already got it, right, and they hold you hostage for it, right? So we had to figure out names that we could actually really buy and have, would have rights to very quickly uh, that we thought would resonate. And it was Capital One because of the capital city, uh, uh, Washington, and we wanted to differentiate ourselves from Richmond. And then, of course, the second one, the, second, the global one, which was uh, our dream that we could take this, the idea into other geographies. We, and we ended up with Capital One. It was easier to get, and there were less people holding us hostage for the name. But, uh, so that, that, that was, was a big change. That was taken, you would have called Capital Two or something. Right? Well, I've heard that. We've, uh, we've, we've had people come in and say, uh, I've, people come in and say, Nigel, I know how to build Capital Two, or Capital Three. <laughs> so we've seen some of that. <laughs> so um, before I actually get into, move on to uh, QED investors, um, there was one question I need to ask with Capital One, um, and it's the whole what's in your wallet campaign. Yeah. Were you, what was the story behind that? Were you uh, part of that and yeah, um, decision maker behind that? Well, what t look, so we, we, f we were doing very well. We were growing nicely. It was fantastic. Um, but we, there were two or three things that had enabled the business that we were really taking advantage of. One was a thing called securitization, which meant that you didn't have to have deposits. You basically could take your loans and sell them into the marketplace. That basically um, uh, uh, crashed rather ignominiously about five years ago with uh, what happened in the market. But that was, a, that was an enabler. The second enabler was that we could use Visa and MasterCard's brand names. Okay? And Visa and MasterCard still to this day have fantastic brand names. People trust that the system is going to work, etc. But we realized that if we were really going to get into the big leagues and in the top five, and we were going to offer other products and services, we could no longer uh, take advantage of the halo effect of Visa and MasterCard. And uh, everything we had done up until this point, we'd, we'd, as I said earlier, we'd be, it was like cheating. We knew the answer before we bet the money. And brands, you can't do that to. Brands, you have to make a very substantial investment and, it, in a sense, get escape velo velocity and put a lot of money into uh, um, creating a brand. And what Rich and I wanted to do, we wanted to create a brand that would get us over the threshold of being just a Visa and MasterCard bank and be a city or an Amex or a Chase. That level of brand. And we figured that would cost $100, $150 million a year in investing in brand. And when we set off on that journey of what's in your wallet, we didn't know it was going to work. We knew we needed to have it, but we didn't know if we could pull it off. And uh, you know, Rich and I did not come from that world. And I do remember huddling with a bunch of brand people where they floated the idea of what's in your wallet. And I remember all of us going, wow, that uh, is a kind of a eureka moment. And you go, that could really work. And then there were the Vikings and the Visigoths and all that stuff that, that followed. And I, when I hear them talk, I always think they're still making fun of me, which is what they were doing then, actually, as they all seem to have those uh, sort of English accents. But, um, <laughs> the, um, but it, we found that we could actually get escape velocity on the brand. And that brand now pulls better than many of the other big big credit card brands, and it got us over Visa and MasterCard, and it enabled Capital One to get into mortgages and auto loans and deposits and all kinds of other businesses. So it was a fantastic enabler. But the, the constituencies that, that were, had been our sort of strategic fulcrum in our business are really bright analytical uh, managers. They were split down the middle on whether or not we should do the brand thing. Why? Because they couldn't test it a priori. They didn't know if it was going to work. And we trained everybody. You know, when you do something, you have to know the answer before you do it. And all of a sudden here, now Richard and Nigel are off the reservation, and they want to, you know, throw caution to the wind and start spending $150 million a year on this idea of building a brand. That was a tough one. It was a really key decision, and we look back on it, and it was the right one. But I would be lying to, to you if I, if I told you that a priori we really knew what was going to happen. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, like, because uh, Business Insider had said that the Capital One slogan, what's in your wallet, is probably the most iconic slogan next to where's the beef, <laughs> right? Um, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So, I mean, that was... It worked. That, that worked. Yeah, and, and the idea was to shock people 
into really taking control of their own financials. And the idea was to, 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 uh, take, to really ha attack the inertia of the American people who were willing to carry around plastic in their wallet where they were being taken advantage of. So what's in your wallet was really asking that question and getting people to t take a moment and, and think about it. I will say this, though. Uh, I was wa watching uh, some of these adverts for gold and silver. Do you know why you should invest in gold and silver because of inflation? And yeah, you would have made all this money in the last five years. Anyway, this, what, this one company, um, Roslyn Financial, I think it's called, and their tagline is, what's in your safe? I just saw them advertising this the other day. I thought, so they're taking what's in your wallet and they're trying to turn it into something else. You should get license fee for that. I think so. I should pay it to me, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, I just wanted to, before we go into Q, QED, I just wanted to highlight that um, they said that Capital One was a technology company selling credit cards. I mean, is that a... Is well, that you know, a when, when people think of technology, they only think about big machines and... Uh, and I mean, big data. Right? I, I think that we were a data-driven company, and we took... Um, discipline, test and learn, and, uh, uh, and analytics further than anybody. And when I listen to a lot of the talk now about big data, and some of you probably use big data in some of your talks, um, you know, big data is just a bigger version of what we were doing. Right? Big data, big means it's more than you can come, currently handle. When we were doing this 20 odd years ago, we had the largest Oracle relational database in the world. And at that point, we were at the edge of what could be processed. Now, of course, that's changed dramatically. But that's what that's what that's all the big means. Big is more than what you can currently handle. So I think we were, you know, one of the original big data companies. And we saw then uh, we've seen Progressive do a fantastic job in insurance. Uh, you've seen Haraz do it in gaming. Uh, you've seen a number of companies who've taken that core approach culturally and made it work. What is really interesting, actually, is that very few of the banks have been able to pull it off. And you might say, well, why is that? And I really think it's cultural. I think it's very hard for a big mainstream bank, particularly today, where the regulatory pressure is so incredibly austere. It's very hard for them to attract the kind of people and to get the, system, the process, get uh, ignition to occur, develop the ecosystem uh, that allows this kind of culture, this flourishing, entrepreneurial, idea-oriented, hypothesis-focused uh, environment to happen. Very difficult to get it to work. Yeah, I mean, I used to work for Merrill Lynch, so I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, no, it's, it's, it's great because, I mean, you guys were the disruptor in the banking, lending industry. You had done <laughs> stock options tied to performance, right? Right. Um, right. No annual fees, uh, balance transfer. I mean, that's all coming from you guys. So Yeah, there was a number of years where Rich and I did not take a salary. I think we made two, had one dollar because we, it was necessary to have a symbolic amount, and our compensation was totally in options. Wow. Now, you know, that was at a time where the regulatory climate was very different. But we had the luxury that way we could do it, and we wanted to believe in our own company. So how to create entrepreneurism and entrepreneurial incentives in a big company structure uh, is not, not at all easy. And you know, um, when, uh, when we used to go to, uh, we, 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 we reached out to all the top business schools and the undergrad schools in the country uh, and around Europe too, and we would uh, develop business cases. And we would work with, with the popular professors and teach those cases. And we found that to be a fabulous way of being able to hijack people that ordinarily would go to Goldman Sachs or Merrill or, or go to BCG or McKinsey and get them to be uh, in, uh, in our web. And we found that very effective. Now, most, most uh, bigger companies and senior people in bigger companies won't go out, reach out to business schools and go and give cases. I mean, they're doing other things. We believe that that, that kind of reach out, that kind of uh, investment paid off Massively. The difference between somebody who is really good and somebody who is phenomenal is massive. And finding the world-class people was a real challenge. Now, those people, I presume, a lot of them are heading uh, west, hopefully heading uh, to the east coast too. But, you know, this is the, this is the, the Googles and the Facebooks uh, have the kind of brand draw that we have. So this is a good conduit time. of our next question, was yep. this QED right. investor? Because, I mean, you've always been pretty entrepreneurial. and. Uh, I mean, it's just, you know, yeah. seeing you in Cap Capital One, it's like, just, it's just an entrepreneur ready to explode, right? And, and so now you're doing QED. Um, so let's talk about that. Like, what are the kinds of uh, investment themes you're investing in? Yeah, well, let me, let, let, there certainly was a, uh, um, it was, it was a fantastic time, Capital One, and, it was, and I wouldn't change it for the world. But, you know, the, um, being, uh, you know, a, a very senior person in a large public company bank, 
uh, has a certain set of things you have to do. And I increasingly found myself looking down on myself saying, you know what, that jacket doesn't fit anymore. That's not who you are. That's not what you want to do. Uh, so that led me then to, uh, to move off stage at Capital One. Everybody thought I was completely bonkers because it was, the company was doing so well. We had 10 years of more than 20% growth rate each year. Um, Einstein once was asked what's the most powerful force in the universe, and he said compounding. So if you go 20% every year for 10 years, you start to get, a, from a, even from a relatively small base, you get to a pretty big number. So we've been able to pull that off. The return on equity was over 25%. The stock price has gone up more than 10x over that period of time, so it was a 10-bagger. And uh, everything was great. But to me, I wasn't learning like I used to learn. I didn't really care for a lot of the things that I had to do as a big company guy. And I like building things. I like building small things. I like surging, growing things. I like the excitement and the verve of that. So um, I left. I spent a year in the UK sort of detoxing from public company life. And then came back and uh, with two other partners uh, at both X Capital One that I, I had been involved in hiring when they'd come out of grad school, we formed QED. And QED, by the way, um, uh, we used to use, I still use QED as a verb. Uh, have you QED'd that? I.e., have you made sure that the analytic is absolutely watertight? What is QED? What does that mean? Anybody going to tell me the Latin? Uh, quad erat demonstratum. That which, is, that which is demonstrated, that which is shown. So, and uh, uh, certainly growing up as a, as a schoolboy in the UK with my fountain pen, they wouldn't let us use biro pens then. You had to have a fountain pen. And uh, you, you, when you, when you uh, uh, solved the math problem, you would write QED at the bottom. So Q, we used to use QED as a verb. And uh, somebody said, well, why don't you just call it QED? Um, so that's, where, that's why we called it QED. Um, but yeah, so this has been fabulously exciting. We're five years in. Uh, we've, um, uh, we, re we thought we were decent strategists. And we thought we were decent operators. We weren't sure if we were any good at investing. Not ca candidly, I'm not even sure if, we're any, if we didn't really know if we're any good even now. But we have a great time doing it, and it keeps us young, it keeps us current, and we get to work with fantastically capable people in their 20s and 30s often, and uh, that's wonderful. So let's, let's, let's go talk about the, uh, the DC startups that you invested. So how did you get in touch with Haroon when webs.com, uh, did, did, did you hear them through the grapevine, or... Did he come up to you and say, hey, I have this idea, or did you come did you yeah, go to them? Like, how, did, how did that work? Just well, one of the things that we, we did uh, here in, uh, in the DC area is we got to know quite quickly um, the, uh, the DC community. You know, from NEA to Colcap to, uh, uh, to Valhalla, you know, we got to know the, the, uh, the, the, um, the folks. And um, these folks have had or knew many of the startup companies. And, we, and our focus was, and is still at QED, you know, data-driven strategies, and we want to help you leverage the data. So we look for organizations that are not so nascent that there isn't any data, and not so, if you like, developed that they think they know what to do with it. It's like catching them in that sweet spot, because we can help um, think through how to leverage this data for competitive advantage, how do you really drive a strategy from data, how do you organize yourself to do it. A lot of the, uh, I, I, I had the chance to speak at Axel's big data conference about three weeks ago. And what was so interesting was that everybody was talking about the cloud and Hadoop and all this sort of stuff. Nobody was talking about what to do with it <laughs> and why it's interesting and why it's important and how do you develop hypotheses from data. And then when you have a hypothesis, what do you do with it? It was all about the sexy piece of technology using that term. So, um, so for us, it's about how do you leverage data and we're very meat and potatoes about that in a sense. So we find companies that we think have a, a really good story to tell. There's something fantastically disruptive in what they will do. It's being led by really creative and innovative folks who are not all about hierarchy and politics and status. That's very, very crucial to us. And are really focused on value and in the right kind of value. We are maniacal about understanding unit, unit economics. So are you going to make money? And how are you going to make money? And how do you know? And have you tested it? Have you seen it make money? I mean, we are in a sense, uh, hammers in search of nails. Because we've seen how it can be used and used well in our cap through our Capital One pedigree. And we look for patterns that resemble that and look to help people develop their own little Capital Ones, if you like. So let's, let's take an example for Braintree. Yeah. So kind of step us through how 
that process? How did you how, got, how did you find Raintree? Uh, well, you know, um, Axel, uh, Jim Breyer, um, uh, in it, uh, who we got to know through Prosper, which is a peer-to-peer -peer company out in the, in the Bay Area. If you don't know about peer-to-peer, -peer, it's something that really is starting to happen in a very interesting way, where the uh, banks are being disintermediated. Uh, banks who are very frozen, who can't attract the talent, who are uh, dealing with regu the regulatory issues, uh, whose revenue sources have been diminished as a result of Dodd-Frank and other things. Uh, so you have entrepreneurial companies enabled by technology and data now beginning to take chunks out of the banking business. One of them is consumer lending. Uh, the leader in the space, uh, consumer lending via peer-to-peer, -peer is Lending Club. Lending Club have probably, you know, the price talk on Lending Club is an IPO uh, next year with a valuation of $1.5 billion. So that's a seriously decent-sized company. So um, uh, we got to know uh, Axel, who I think are a fabulous VC firm. You, you of course, all know them. And um, they um, said, look, there's this company called Braintree. Um, they would benefit from the kind of thinking um, that QED brings to the table. So um, we, uh, I met Brian, uh, Brian Johnson, you mentioned, mentioned him earlier. They just brought in a, a fabulous CEO, um, uh, Bill Reddy, uh, who's a, a wonderful guy. And um, we sort of hit it off and uh, I joined the board and Frank and Caribou, my two partners, have been very involved in that. And that's done extremely well. They have this, they have this fabulous niche of being able to um, uh, talk to the developer, the developer community. Um, on their own terms. Yeah, I mean, PayPal had to issue a specific report, a press release addressing Braintree because Braintree has been cannibalizing PayPal. I mean, the CEO had to like, actually make a press release. Yeah. So it's well, crazy. I mean, they're almost on track with um, Square, right? I look, I think they see, they see the, uh, um, the challenge of Square. And in some ways, Braintree is actually uh, stronger. Uh, I mean, internationally, for instance, Braintree um, is stronger. But yeah, look, I think that um, what's so interesting like in peer-to-peer -peer or in the space that Braintree and, uh, and Square occupy, and this, the, this is not what a single winner takes all. I think there's real, the, this, these markets are so big and the opportunity is so, um, uh, so evolving, so getting bigger. You know, um, uh, you know, if you imagine uh, you know, what's happening to uh, digital marketing today and the opportunity to sell product online, and we see you know, enormous amounts of advertising now beginning to shift uh, to the online space. So much of what we try to do is, is uh, be in a position where the wind is going to be at our back. Uh, Rich Fairbanks taught me one thing, many things, but one thing he taught me was uh, that you prefer to be, uh, look for places where industry forces are at, uh, uh, behind you. The idea being you'd rather be a, um, a, an average manager in a great business than a great manager in an average business. So select industry, industry forces are really powerful. It's like gravity. You can't fight it. Get, uh, and then get your great, great entrepreneurs. But make sure the wind is at your back. And brain, the wind is at Braintree's back. The wind is at the, the back of the peer-to-peer -peer lenders. That's one, of your, that's one of your themes. Like, Yeah. You look, look at what's happening and, and project those themes. Um, when, I, when I went to the UK, actually, I, uh, I spent a year uh, talking to all the private equity and venture capital firms that, I, that would talk to me. And remember, I told you earlier, I couldn't even spell what those things meant, and I, so I went to school on that. And, uh, and I, I teamed up with, Gen uh, with uh, uh, General Atlantic in the private equity space because they were strategic about the, how they thought about themes. Those, that's, but this is now five, six years ago, no longer, actually, seven or eight years ago. They were focused on... Uh, uh, customer service uh, banks are going to move to low-cost providers in India. Um, stock exchanges are going to become digitalized. Client server is going to be really powerful. And they, uh, um, uh, of goods are going to move online in terms of being able to be sold. I mean, they saw themes like that and they make bets on themes. All too often, actually, uh, venture capitalists and uh, private equity firms are uh, agnostic about themes. They're all about the deal. And I think that there's something about, uh, to me, there's something reassuring about real discipline in terms of thinking through what are the mega themes that you can bet on, uh, learn to recognize those patterns, and then swim in those streams rather than attempt to be all things to all people. Okay, um, I, I want to open up the Q&A here, but, but there's one question I want to, well, one topic I want to talk about is DC. Right. You had an opportunity to opportunity to go to New York. I mean, Capital One is a financial corporation, and what made you stay here? 
you know, it, 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 it wasn't terribly uh, systematic. We were, we, uh, Rich and I were both here. Our kids were in school here. Um, we, 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 uh, we recognized that the kind of talent we needed uh, would be attracted to probably half a dozen cities in America. Uh, May, uh, LA, San Francisco, maybe Chicago, Boston, New York, Washington, maybe Atlanta. Um, those are places where you could attract the best people from the best schools and they would come. Uh, we tried to recruit the best people into Richmond and they wouldn't come. Richmond didn't work. I mean, when, when you're 22 or you're 26, you don't want to go and live in Richmond. Now, when you're 36, it's a fabulous place to live and the real estate is half of the price that it is here and you can bring your families up and it can be wonderful. But, wh but when you're looking to attract a really talented uh, single people, you have to be in the right city. And we felt the competition for the kind of talent that we wanted was not here in Washington. So we would have a, an opportunity to really be the Washington place where great people would come. And that worked out really well. The consulting firms tend to put their headquarters in, in New York. Uh, the iBankers all put their headquarters in New York. So Washington was a place that really worked for us. And, if I might say, it also was 103 miles to Richmond, where all our operations were. So there was no other place that was in driving distance of Richmond. But BC was where we were, and it really worked. And it's been really cherishing, actually, if you look back now, how many people from Capital Ones, uh, maybe AOLs, some of the big entities that really grew up in this geography, stay here, leading to a whole bunch of other entrepreneurs. So the question is, if you didn't have family, you didn't have all that, uh, you know, your roots here, as you had mentioned, would you have stayed in DC? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, 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 every, yes, time I, every time I go to the Bay Area, I must tell you, I, think I really like the weather and the idea of being able to go ride my bike in the mountains. And um, yeah, I don't know. Um, it, I think that certainly probably, uh, you know, a foot either side of the country would have really worked. So um, it's a big old country flying across five hours oh, understand. every other week. Oh. Um, so, so do you, do you think that the DC government is doing enough because, you know, about the startup community here? I mean, you, you know, you, you say that Capital One being the flagship company is uh, drawing talent here, right? And as a result, a startup ecosystem flourishes, right? Right. Um, do you think that the DC government or even Virginia, Maryland, there are certain well, we, things that they, they we, need we to got do some help. We got some help from time to time from Virginia. Uh, we got, I, I mean, I'm going back a long time here, but we really didn't have a lot to do with DC, per se, and, and virtually nothing to do with Maryland. It's very interesting how you have three different countries here. You have uh, Maryland, uh, Virginia, and DC. And people who live in Virginia, I don't know how many of you do, uh, the last thing that you do, unless you have to, is to cross that river. It's very interesting when you get uh, living social or uh, uh, Groupon o uh, offers and how they're done based on geographic proximity, right? So they think of me in Alexandria, they think, oh, you know, there's an opportunity for Nigel to go and do something, and it's only 4.1 miles. I look at where that is, and I say, I've got to cross that river, so I'm not doing it. You show me something south, and I might do it. And I think there's a real, uh, the, we think of this region as if it's one homogenous mass. It isn't, by any means. It's really parochial, and it's three separate uh, countries in many ways. Now, so there, then the question is, is DC uh, attract the right? I, I don't have a good sense for that. Um, when I look at uh, some of the opportunities to manage DC better, there's clearly a lot of opportunities. But, you know, uh, look, I think there's a thriving um, entrepreneurial class here in uh, Washington. I think that's great. Um, I, I watch, um, I don't think any of you have been to Berlin recently. But, you know, everybody makes fun of German entrepreneurism in Dusseldorf or Munich, and there really isn't much. But you go to Berlin, and there's a real renaissance happening. And it comes from, I think, uh, the uh, management of a city saying, you know what, we're going to attract entrepreneurs and we're going to give them a break. We're going to give them space. We're going to give them op opportunity. We're going to give them technology. Uh, we're going to give them opportunity to be able to m use their businesses to help us in the things that we do. And you can really make a lot of things happen. Okay, well, uh, we'd like to open up the floor for Q&A, so probably the, uh, maybe five, ten minutes. So we always open it up. So who wants to ask a question? There you go, there you go. Uh, I have a, um, a, a more of an operations question, I guess. It's really interesting with Capital One how much data you guys managed. Um, but as someone who said that when you first got into Capital One, you didn't have a lot of management experience, 
you're coming from strategy consulting, going into just an actual just operations management role in the company where you had so much data, but day to day you've just got basic dashboards and things that you may pay attention to to manage the company. What are some of the things that you looked at when you were first growing Capital One from a day to day management standpoint, just in your staff, the types of data that you really cared about, aside from you know, the, the product oriented stuff where we want to test here and test here? Just what data did you really care about? How did you use it operationally um, to, to best effect, maybe with an example or two? But thanks so much for coming. Yeah, uh, look, um, what, what, what I did find was that the dashboards that were being used by operational people largely um, often weren't where the leverage was. And I, loved the, I used to love to go through the things that they were looking at and say, why, why do you look at that? And, and do, you, do you look at that? Yes, they'd say. Well, what do you do with it? And let's imagine instead of it being four, it's nine. What are you going to do differently? And they, they, if they're not going to do anything differently as a result of a difference in the numbers, then it's an irrelevant measure. So customer service, what would you measure? Um, I want to measure, uh, I want to measure, I want to focus on uh, how quickly are you picking the phone up? So the t what they call the t uh, 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 time to answer. So how many rings? Uh, and what's the abandon rate? How many people bail out on you? Because somebody who bails out on you who was going to call you you know, that, but they're telling you something, and you're probably hurting the brand. What's the, uh, what's the talk time? How long is the talk time? That was an important measure uh, to look at. Um, we we um, very quickly started to move uh, to uh, giving the, uh, the, the call center reps the opportunity to do things that were to enrich the role. If you're just it, uh, getting inbound calls all day, and you have to say, stay seated in one of those chairs um, with your nodding dog animal thing and your picture of you know, Steve McQueen or whatever it was, that is a miserable life unless you're getting the opportunity to learn and grow and do different stuff. So we very quickly focused on sort of a, a, a growth ladders of uh, taking on new skills. One of them was the opportunity to sell to somebody. And if, if you treat them well and you answer the question well, uh, the consumer is giving you permission cardholder will give you permission to actually uh, sell them something. If you do a miserable job of servicing them and they're really PO'd because they've been waiting for 27 minutes, it's impossible to do it. So you find actually that better customer service gives you the opportunity, permission, to create better revenue streams, to cross-sell products and services, which actually binds the customer more to you, which creates better annuities. So um, what we would do is look at measures that would uh, reflect much longer term measures, the longer tail, if you like, uh, that would be really driving economics. So we took it all, we, we would start from scratch and build it up based on the things that we cared about, and then classically incentivize people on the things that mattered and drove it right through the organization. Great. Sounds like the Zappos rule. Um, next question. Yeah. What areas of, uh, what industries are interesting to you in terms of kind of what you guys do and, and your expertise on data-driven kind of uh, processes, what er what areas are, or industries are interesting at this point to you? Yeah, look, yeah, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, and we, we, the two principal areas where we focus has been around digital marketing. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of dollars moving into the online space and a lot of selling going on there. And you know, Capital One's uh, internal. Uh, um, uh, motif used to motif used to be you know sell the right product to the right customer at the right time at the right price, and in a sense that's what a lot of what's happening in the digital space is. What ad are you showing to what person at what time, and how do you get the best conversion? So um, the, the 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 same framework works there. In financial services is very interesting, of course, and it's massive, and it is so frozen today, and so little innovation going on with the banks who are focused on many other things. That gives us tremendous opportunity. Outside of that, uh, we think insurance is really interesting. Uh, we have a company, for instance, that uh, collects the data uh, on, on how you drive your car. And that data can be very powerful in predicting uh, you know, whether or not you're going to crash your car. The ki kind of car you drive, the way you, dr the, and, and you as a human being are very predictive. Actually, Progressive found 10 years ago that a, a credit score, a FICO score, was a better predictor of whether or not somebody was going to crash the car than their actual models. So why is that? Because the FICO score predicts discipline. It predicts how organized you are, how footprint. And anyway, so we have a company that collects that data of how you drive your car. What a snapshot, is that what it's called with Progressive, I think? 
um, that, a company that basically does that, and we find that very powerful as a predictor. So where, the, where there's new data that can be captured that can actually create disruption in an industry. Healthcare is another fabulous space. You know, you're, many of you are walking around with bracelets now to collecting certain data. What do you do with that data? It's, not, it's fun that you can show it up on your, uh, on your iPad and you can collect it through time and you can send it to your Facebook friends. But, what do you, but how does it change any outcomes? How does it change any real behaviors? And how do you get paid for that? We find that space really interesting. If anything, we're really worried that we're spreading ourselves far too thin. There's only really three partners and there's so much opportunity. Okay, one last question. Um, how's it going? So, uh, what um, what data do you care about the most right now? That what, the, what the hookah? What what sorts of data do you care about the most right now that you're having um, maybe the most difficult time to actually get into? Um, what what data um, do we cover the most that we can't get hold of easily? Um, what's I think this is a, a uni this is a, a theme. It's how. Um, so many companies that are in the consumer business in some way who are unable to really understand um, uh, their, uh, their own unit economics. So um, if I book a customer, I, create a, I uh, acquire a customer of some kind, what do I believe the economics of that customer are going to be through time and how do I know? It's so interesting how very few people actually focus on that. I think often because uh, the investment community doesn't, doesn't ask them that question. Um, asking people about their fixed and variable costs. I mean, we're talking about very simple micro-econ stuff, not whiz-bang uh, you know, uh, uh, stuff about, around big data. A lot of basic stuff that people don't understand who, who are off building business, getting customers, and they have no idea if they're good customers or bad customers. One of the things that we really focus on a great deal is understanding unit economics and then understanding what we call customer slope. And customer slope is the difference between your best decile of customers and your worst decile. In a business where it's very flat, there's not a lot of leverage in segmentation because they're all kind of the same. It's a modulus bunch of customers. Very seldom do you get that, actually, and you'll see 3 to 4x, but often you'll see 15, 20x. And in businesses where you have enormous amounts of slope, there's a lot of power in figuring out which customers you really want to get and targeting them a priori and how very few entities really think about that. So, um, we think that uh, being able to understand your own unique unit economics, understand them in net present value or cohort or annuity terms, and then be able to use that data to, to pass out which ones you want at the front end, rather than getting ones you don't want and then figuring out what to try and do with them. Get the right ones first. Okay, so we have two last questions. Um, one question, so the, this one question, this is the only question I would ask you. I would, I would never ask any other founders. But, ready for this? Well, so what's in your wallet? Oh, what's in my wallet? Um, you know, uh, what's in my wallet? You know, here's a, I'll tell you this. Uh, this, is, this is absolutely true. I, um, I go, you, uh, you know, from time to time, I go out to dinner with people uh, when I was uh, president of Capital One, and I would pull out an Amex card to pay for dinner. <laughs> and people would go, wow, you know, what, why, why'd you have a, a Capital One card? And what happens is, if you're a senior officer of a bank, uh, and, you are, uh, and the bank is, in a sense, lending money to you, because they're giving you a credit card, you would have to, you have to fill in enormous form, amounts of forms at the end of every month to, to prove that you're not borrowing from the bank and running off with that money or using it for something else. So I just said, I'm not doing that. That's ridiculous. I'm going to use an Amex card. And anybody who asks me, I'm going to keep telling them that story. And that's exactly what happened. So I, never, I don't think I've ever had a Capital One credit card. Really? Yeah. Well, but I do, have, I do have some of the uh, headgear of the Visigoths uh, at the Vi uh, with the Viking helmets from the, the very early uh, commercials we did. <laughs> wow, OK. Well, uh, we'll take that out post-production. Right. Right. So, um, so the last question, the most important question we always ask our guests is, Who's your favorite superhero and why? My favorite superhero. You know, I, I, um, I was never really a comic book kind of chap, so I didn't really, didn't really know a lot of, uh, of superheroes. But I did go back and do a little research and looked at this, and I found there was a, um, a, a Captain Britain. And what this guy did, he, um, he just like, um, just like um, uh, um, the Arthurian legend that many of you have read, 
when England is in the time of crisis, Arthur will rise again from, where was he, uh, Tintagel? No, not that was a castle where he was born, um, from uh, Glastonbury. If you've been to the tour at Glastonbury. And he's going to rise and protect England. Um, and, you know, when you look at poor old England now, and we've got Prince Harry over here, that's great, everybody likes that, we do a good parade, no doubt about that, right? Even Margaret Thatcher's parade was good. But what we don't do very well is grow economies, and we are sitting around with austerity problem there, you know, uh, we've got uh, GDP growth of about zero. Um, it goes up a little bit when we have the Olympics, and then it fades away again. So I think England really needs a superhero to come and uh, take care of the economy. Well, <clears throat> I, uh, you, obviously you told me the answer, and uh, uh, I went on eBay to look for Captain Britain. And you couldn't find it. I couldn't find him, yeah. but I did find him, actually. Did you? Right, good. But the only way I can get to Captain Britain was to buy Spider-Man. <laughs> Ah, is, is, is he yeah, I mean, like, Spider-Man. That's, that's my favorite superhero, by oh, the way. Okay. Yeah, so, Spider-Man, Captain Britain here. So. That works for me. All right, there you yeah. go. Ladies and gentlemen. Very cool. Nigel Morris. Thank you. All right.